give an overview of the uh, Clearer Renegade Center project, uh, which Invenergy is proposing uh, to be constructed in uh, Powerville, Rhode Island. Uh, first of all, I would like to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, Invenergy. Uh, Invenergy is a, a private company. It was founded in 2001. Uh, we uh, develop, uh, build, own, operate uh, projects uh, throughout the U.S., Canada, Europe, uh, and uh, uh, South America. Uh, currently, we have developed today about 13,000 megawatts of, uh, of projects, uh, principally uh, wind projects. We're one of the largest land-based uh, wind uh, developers in, in the U.S., um, and we're also uh, one of the largest uh, energy storage uh, developers in the U.S. Uh, you can see from this map that you know we pretty much span the U.S. and the eastern part of uh, Canada and the eastern interconnect. Uh, there are other uh, wind projects that we have in Europe uh, and some uh, solar projects that are being developed down in Central and South America and in uh, Japan. Uh, to date, we've developed about 68 uh, wind projects totaling over 6,500 megawatts. Uh, eight solar projects totaling uh, over 144 megawatts. Uh, uh, energy storage projects that uh, total up to about 88 megawatts. We use those principally with our wind projects to help uh, smooth out the, uh, the, uh, the, the, variants, uh, the variations that you have in production uh, and for regulation purposes. And uh, we have about 5,800 megawatts of gas fired uh, projects that are in operation or in uh, development. So, you know, the way we look at energy production is really sort of spanning the, the, uh, the, the breadth of technologies that, uh, and we see them all as being complementary to one another. Um, and, and so I think ultimately our goal is to try to develop a, an energy infrastructure that is uh, energy efficient, reliable, and um, able to, uh, you know, help reduce, uh, you know, or increase the overall efficiency of the system and, uh, you know, reduce uh, emissions, you know, that, that's essentially the goal that we have. Uh, the Clear River Energy Center project is a combined cycle project. Uh, it's a uh, advanced technology project uh, using uh, GE technology, uh, advanced H-class combustion turbines. Uh, it'll be the most efficient plant uh, using a fossil fuel in New England. Uh, it'll use air-cooled condensers uh, minimizing uh, the need for water for cooling. Uh, it'll have dual fuel capability uh, so that it would be able to be reliable and operate in the event that you know there is an interruption in the natural gas. Um, we have uh, bid the project into the full capacity auction that uh, was referred to earlier in the slide deck. Um, the half of the project has been selected. The other half we're anticipating and bid, bidding into the upcoming FCA 11. Uh, you know, the project is located, um, if this is a rendering of the project. I have another slide here that will show you, uh, you know, the, the location. What you see here is, uh, yeah, this is the air-cooled condensers. This is the power island, uh, you know, ancillary equipment, the operations center. Uh, the whole power island is being provided by GE. Uh, it's located adjacent to uh, Specter Energy's Algonquin uh, compressor station uh, on a site that has uh, a fairly significant buffer all around. And within the site that Specter owns, it's about a 730 acre site. Uh, they not only have the high pressure gas pipeline that the project would connect to, but also uh, double circuit uh, 345 kV electric transmission lines. Uh, that uh, has a right of way that the project will be utilizing in order to interconnect into the electric grid. Uh, you know, one of the things that we saw when we first started looking at New England in terms of, uh, you know, the need that was projected in New England and uh, where to locate a project, uh, you know, the ISO has, uh, you know, published the uh, electric reliability outlook over the past couple of years, and within that uh, publication they had noted that there are a number of units that are either retiring or at risk of retiring. And, and the total of these units really represent uh, about uh, a third of the generating capacity in New England. You know, so when you, when you look at that, you think, you know, if a third of the capacity is going to be going away, it really needs to be replaced by something. And obviously, you know, there's going to be a, a mix of generation capacity uh, resources that would be brought in uh, to help uh, replace that need. Certainly wind projects, solar projects, 
but you, you still need to have something else to help complement that to make sure that you know the lights stay on when uh, you know when it's dark out or when the wind isn't uh, blowing. The uh, you know we see uh, a variety of benefits associated with the project. Uh, certainly, it'll create uh, local jobs in terms of long-term jobs with the uh, the staff that'll be required in order to operate the project. There'll be uh, construction staff for the short-term construction, two, two and a half year construction that will go on. Uh, the project will be uh, paying taxes to the town of Coverville. Uh, so there's certainly a significant uh, tax revenue that the town will be able to realize. And as we outlined in our uh, energy facility siting board application, uh, due to the project's efficiency, um, we do see that there will be uh, ratepayer savings that would be a result of this project going into service. And that really just comes out as a result of the project having a, a, a very high efficiency, uh, being able to produce energy at lower cost as compared to the existing resources in the region. And, you know, that coupled with the fact that, you know, putting in a project like this, bidding it into the ISO's uh, forward capacity auction actually helped lower the capacity price that cleared in, in the last auction. I think you saw on the slide earlier where the ISO was proposing to break New England into three zones, the, the, the Maine and Vermont uh, zone, the southeastern New England zone, which includes Rhode Island, and the uh, rest of, uh, the, the, rest of the, the state. Uh, the, the southeastern uh, New England zone, which was formerly the southeastern Mass Rhode Island zone, over the prior auctions had cleared at the cap, had the most expensive capacity uh, in the region, if not, if not the country. Um, and as a result, you know, that, that's really the part of the function of the ISO's capacity auction is to send pricing signals to developers like Infinity and others that you know, this is an area where we need to have generation, and that's one of the reasons why we started looking at the southeast and New England zone, and, and specifically in, in Rhode Island. Um, one of the other things that the project will do is it, it's, it's a highly flexible project, and by that we mean um, it has a fast start capability, it uh, has a high ramp rate capability, and so as you integrate more renewables, which you know, we are definitely in favor of, and, and we see that happening over the course of the coming years, uh, you need to have resources that have the ability to interact with those and so that the ISO you know, can dispatch units maintaining the generating capacity that they need in order to keep the lights on. You know, I think one of the things that folks don't uh, really appreciate you know, is the, the challenge that the ISO has in order to keep the lights on is that it's really an instantaneous uh, uh, process that they have to maintain. I mean, the uh, generation has to match the load almost exactly. Otherwise, what you're going to see is a drop in voltage or a drop in frequency. And, and folks at home will probably see that as, you know, your lights may start to dim or what have you. And so it's a constant uh, balancing act that the ISO has to go through. So um, as you bring in, you know, uh, more uh, intermittent and variable resources like renewables, uh, you need complementary resources to help create that balance that you need. And so that's one of the benefits that we see, you know, in this project. And then and certainly, finally, one of the benefits that we also see is that due to its efficiency uh, and the fact that it's, you know, uh, this advanced technology that we're employing, it's actually going to be able to reduce emissions that uh, the existing fleet that we're relying on now is currently emitting. When you plug in a unit like this, it's not only going to reduce costs, but it's also going to reduce emissions. And uh, that's something that, uh, you know, that we see as a benefit. I've already spoken to uh, the, the jobs and the, the tax revenue that we see the project uh, would uh, provide. Um, <clears throat> ratepayer savings, we, you know, we did an evaluation of uh, what we perceived to be the ratepayer savings. We had been through uh, some hearings with the Public Utility Commission on this. Uh, I think the uh, Public Utility Commission felt that our savings, they, their view was that they could have been overestimated, but they said that they're certainly going to be meaningful. Um, you know, depending upon how you, you, you view the uh, forecast in the markets, you know, that's, that's really what results in determining, you know, what that ultimate value is. I think uh, ultimately the Public Utility Commission, you know, agreed with the fact that there are going to be great payer savings there. Um, other things that the Public Utility Commission looked at was that the, uh, the uh, trying to maintain or meet the uh, goals that have been set out 
uh, by uh, Rhode Island's, uh, the, the Rhode Island Energy uh, 2035, it's called, uh, and they felt that you know this this project would be consistent with the goals that have been established in there, as well as the Rhode Island Resilient Act in terms of you know being able to help uh, reduce overall emissions and and increase efficiency associated with the power generation sector. Uh, you know we had provided information to the Public Utility Commission you know based on our expectations of, of emissions. Uh, they had their experts review it, and I think they generally concurred with. Uh, you know, the information that was provided. The, uh, getting a little more detail into that, the, uh, you know, supporting renewables and, and reducing emissions, you know, the offsets that we saw that were created, you know, here indicated on the table, on, on an annual basis, you can see that there's, you know, emissions reductions that are created, not only in terms of uh, CO2, uh, NOx, and, and, and uh, sulfur, di sulfur dioxide, uh, and that really is just a direct reflection of the, uh, you know, the efficiency of the unit um, and, and the fact that it's going to be displacing other units that would otherwise have to be out there uh, producing the power that would be needed. You know, th these reductions, this is something that we've seen here in New England really over the, the course of the past several uh, years, if not uh, you know, over the past decade. And, you know, this is a, a chart that was uh, published out by uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, environmental, or the, rather the, the uh, Energy Information Administration. And, and what, what's notable here is that you see uh, reductions of, you know, uh, various sectors, but in the power generation sector you see uh, a reduction in emissions. And, and, and what that chart is really telling you is that the, uh, these reductions really have come about of the fact that as you introduce new, more efficient, uh, you know, better performing, uh, generating plants, you're going to see a reduction like that. And, and we see that reduction continuing. Now, obviously, it's going to get to a point where you're not going to be able to continue that, you know, forever. And so the only way to keep that going is you're going to have to bring in more renewables ultimately. And, and then I think that goal is something that we all want to see, you know, which is trying to get us to a sustainable, uh, a sustainable end generation infrastructure in the future. Um, as I said earlier, you know, we see the project as uh, supporting uh, the Rhode Island Resilient Act. Uh, that act that I think was alluded to in the uh, uh, slide that the, the isolate put up earlier calls for emission reductions, you know, in 2020 and 2035, an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050. Um, you know, we, we see that, you know, this project having the ability to help incorporate those added renewables as being supportive of meeting the goals of that act. Uh, just to touch briefly upon uh, some of the other interconnections that the project has, uh, we certainly have a, uh, a water interconnection requirement, a wastewater interconnection, electricity interconnection, interconnecting into the grid, and natural gas interconnection. As water, as I'm sure many of you heard, you know, we uh, were originally planning on utilizing uh, a well from uh, Pasco Utility District. That well had been contaminated, and our proposal was that we would uh, install a treatment system to help clean up that, that well. Uh, I think through the process of uh, EFSFB hearings and uh, the public comment period, there was some concern and questions raised about, you know, the potential use of that well. And uh, Pasco Utility had, you know, uh, rethought their uh, their desire to allow us to use that well, or for them to reactivate that well. And so they had terminated the uh, water supply uh, letter of intent that we had with them. So we're currently out looking uh, for other water sources. We do have some alternatives that we're looking at, and we hope to be able to provide folks, you know, some more clarity on what the water supply is going to be here in, in the very near future. Um, well, the wastewater discharge, our plan is to connect into uh, the Barrowville Wastewater Treatment Plant, and we've had discussions with the, the Barrowville Wastewater uh, Sewer Commission, and uh, you know, that process is moving forward. Um, the electrical interconnection is uh, going to require a new uh, approximately 6.8 mile, 345 kV transmission line that will go from the project over to the Sherman Road substation uh, utilizing an existing right-of-way that is owned by National Grid, and we are working with National Grid 
to put together the necessary permits uh, for that uh, electrical interconnection. Uh, the natural gas pipeline is uh, fairly straightforward. The project is located adjacent to uh, Spectre's compressor, uh, Barville compressor station, so a very short lateral that would be required for uh, connecting the project into the gas infrastructure. One of the reasons why we selected that location was the fact that the main gas pipeline is there. You know, <clears throat> as I said earlier, you know, looking at uh, the uh, ISO New England map and uh, you know where there was need for new projects, the southeastern Mass, Rhode Island, that sector, as I said, had you know cleared at the cap during uh, prior auctions. Um, so that meant that there was really insufficient generation within that zone to meet its need. And because, you know, as uh, Weezy said earlier, you know, it's a capacity import constrained zone, meaning you can't have power generation being located outside of that zone and import into it. You really needed to be having new generation located within that zone. And, you know, when you're talking about, you know, project of this size, uh, in order to find a suitable location, you really have to be at a point where you have the infrastructure available. And th there's really not too many locations within New England where you have uh, a large natural gas pipeline, uh, high voltage uh, transmission lines, you know, all within a similar site. Um, you know, it's, uh, I would imagine that there's really, you know, probably you know, one or two sites like that. Um, but when you look at you know the available capacity on both electric transmission and on natural gas, you know the list of available sites you know becomes uh, very very short, uh, very quickly. So that that's ultimately how we ended up being at this location. Uh, one of the other issues that the, the project is dealing with is meeting the uh, Barville noise ordinance. They have a, uh, a requirement for both uh, A-weighted noise. Uh, which is 43 dBA, which we have committed to meeting. Uh, they also have an octave band requirement, uh, you know, for, for the various uh, noise limits at, at various octave bands. Um, we have asked for a waiver for some of the lower sections of the octave bands, uh, which uh, Barrowville uh, Planning Board had agreed with, but the Zoning Board had not agreed with. Um, so, you know, that, that discussion will continue with the uh, Energy Facility Siting Board to determine if uh, you know, ultimately it could be uh, you know, either granted a waiver or uh, have to further modify the project to try to meet it. Uh, our view is that it, it's really not possible to try to meet it since the uh, octave band limits were set so low. Uh, there's also uh, a major source air permitting process that we have to go through. Uh, we have filed a permit application with uh, RIDEM. Uh, you know, that process is ongoing. Uh, it's probably got uh, you know, I would say probably at least another year ago. Um, the Energy Facility Siting Board process has, uh, we're just getting into the hearing phase, so there'll be hearings later on this year and perhaps into early next year. You know, so there's a continuing process that's going to go on here that uh, will not only involve hearing, but you know, further public involvement. Uh, you know, one, one chart that I found interesting <clears throat> that uh, I think some people don't realize is, you know, when you look at the National Ambient Air Quality Standards that uh, the EPA has established um, and that they use as guidance for uh, determining whether or not, you know, projects are, uh, you know, new air emitting projects, you know, can be, uh, can be allowed. Uh, I, you know, the, the chart that you have here is I, I put together looking at uh, you know, some of the various criteria pollutants that they ask us to evaluate. And you can see where we have, this is the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. The red is what is in the background, in the background here that you see out there, and then the blue is, is what the plant emits. So I won't go through all the details of these, but you can see for the various pollutants, you know, CO, PM, uh, NOx, that you know, the emissions that you have from a project like this is uh, certainly low, albeit there are emissions associated with it, and that's why we have to go through the uh, air permitting process with uh, Thank you. Thank you.